Hello, my friends of the psychedelic renaissance. It's Tom Hatzis, your psychedelic historian, and this is Ergot and the Salem Witch Trials. While I have made it my life's work to uncover the hidden gems of psychedelic history, sometimes I have to go in the opposite direction and show where popular culture and popular paradigms are actually mistaken about psychedelic history. One of those areas being the Salem Witch Trials of 1692, which some researchers believed was actually caused by ergotism, a form of poisoning that comes from ingesting ergot, a fungus that grows on diseased grain. Ergot is well known by hippies, heads, chemists, and mystics as the precursor for LSD. As such, it has been argued that some of the bizarre behavior that took place in Salem might have been caused by ergotism. In this video, I'd like to address the origins of this belief, how popular media distorts it, and what really happened that most foul and cold winter of 1692. But first, if you're into this kind of content, please subscribe to the Psychedelic Historian YouTube channel, and make sure you hit that little bell icon so that you're notified every time I post a new video. Also, it'd be great to link up with you on Instagram. Please find me at Psychedelic Historian. And we do have a private Facebook group, the Sanctum Psychedelia group, where we talk about all things wild and weird. We'd love to have you join that conversation. But for now, let's get into Salem and Ergot. Let me start off by saying that psychedelics and even Ergot do have a role to play in psychedelic history. But that role has often been exaggerated. So much so that it seems now that any odd happenstance from history can be said to have some kind of psychedelic origin. I don't want the discipline of psychedelic history to go the way of ancient aliens. So if I seem a little passionate, that's why. The Ergot at Salem hypothesis, first conceived in the late 1970s, has somewhat been resurrected in recent years. The idea was first put forth by Linda Caporal in her article titled, Ergotism, the Satan Loosed in Salem, published in 1976. The proposition was quickly debunked by other scholars in the field, like Stephen Niesenbaum and Nicholas Spanos. And it all but disappeared from popular thought until 1989, when Mary Kilborn Matosian included it in her book, Poisons of the Past. Matassian strengthened the original argument by actually including certain records from the time that kind of do sound like ergot poisoning, but I'll get into those later. For now, I'd like to begin by showing how popular media distorts not only the idea of ergot's role potentially in the Salem Witch Trials, but how it distorts psychedelic history generally. There are two oft-repeated mistakes in modern media regarding the possible role of ergot and the Salem Witch Trials. First, the authors will exaggerate the role of ergotism in history. Second, the authors will liken the LSD experience to the ergotism experience. Let's begin with an article from Vox.com written in 2015 titled, The Hallucinogens That Might Have Sparked the Salem Witch Trials by Phil Edwards and Estelle Caswell. So to my first point about the way authors exaggerate the role of ergotism in history, take this line right here. Other scholars have attributed many cases of mass hysteria, like the Dancing Plague of 1518, and many of the European witch trials, to ergotism. So just to start, no scholar actually believes that the Dancing Plague of 1518 was caused by ergotism. Not one. Second, since there is actually no scholar in the field who believes this, the link that Vox takes you to doesn't go to any scholar in the field. It goes instead to a Wikipedia page, which when then you read the Wikipedia page, you realize that Wikipedia is getting it from the Encyclopedia Britannica. The person who wrote the entry for the Encyclopedia Britannica page is Patricia Bauer, who holds a degree in theater and Spanish. Look, I love both good theater and language studies, but they're not history. And nothing about studying theater or Spanish prepares a person to be able to interpret historical documents, any more than it prepares them in automotive repair. So it doesn't really matter that the source is the quite prestigious Encyclopedia Britannica. 
What matters is who is actually writing the entries. The point is, while the authors claim that scholars have attributed the Dancing Plague of 1518 to ergotism, that is a gross misapprehension of the truth. Let's go back and look at the second claim found in that sentence, which is that scholars also attribute the European witch trials to ergotism. Now, as someone who has actually studied the primary source materials to write my book, The Witch's Ointment, I can say with confidence that ergotism played a very minor role in the larger breadth of medieval and early modern witchcraft. It played some role, of course, and I will be making a video about it for my Magic Herb series, although ergot isn't technically an herb, but whatever. There were other contributing factors that were far more influential than ergot could have ever been for causing these witch panics. And it seems that the authors might actually know this, because if you click on the link that they provide to cite their source, the page it brings you to doesn't say anything about ergot, least of which its association with witchcraft. Moving forward, Vox offers a perfect example of my second point, this need to liken the LSD experience to being poisoned by ergot. Some symptoms of ergotism do resemble LSD. Incidentally, the Encyclopedia Britannica says, Severe hallucinations can also be a symptom as lysergic acid is the substance from which the drug LSD is synthesized. These symptoms were the same as those shown by the accused in Salem. Let's explore that. Ergotism is pretty harsh and comes in two forms, gangrenous and convulsive. Since there are no reports of gangrene in and around Salem at the time, the focus on the modern theorists is that convulsive ergot was the cause of the Salem witch trials. So, what are the symptoms of convulsive ergotism? As the name implies, your body convulses and spasms. You sweat profusely. You run a high fever for about a week, sometimes two, have headaches and muscle aches, and grow ever more delirious while a burning underneath your skin roars with all the fires of hell. That is nothing like the LSD experience. Now, to their credit, the Vox authors do offer a dissenting voice in the form of Nicholas Spanos. However, I still find it somewhat problematic that they put these two competing theories on the same level as if they hold the same amount of weight. They don't. Now, I could go on about this, but I'd rather move into the second part of this video, which is how historians handle these kinds of situations. If we are going to find ergotism as the cause of the Salem Witch Trials, then we will find evidence for ergotism at the beginning of the Salem Witch Trials. So, how did the Salem Witch Trials begin? In 1692, a 12-year-old girl named Anne Putnam came down with a malady of aches and pains that nobody could explain. Little Anne, unfortunately, came from a very unhealthy bloodline, losing many of her siblings, and she herself would actually die at the young age of 37. In the days leading up to her illness, Anne had been gathering with other girls from in and around the village to hang out with Tichiba, a Caribbean wise woman and slave. We don't know much about Tichiba. We do know that echoes of her homeland stayed with her, and she would often engage in certain kinds of Caribbean magical practices to entertain the young girls. And so, they formed a little magical circle. Now, not long after, another girl named Betty Paris also grew ill. Well, not ill exactly. She would go back and forth between quietly staring into space and screaming really loud, and then going right back to staring into space. That's not ergot poisoning. Soon, another girl named Abigail Williams caught a similar malady. Only she took the odd behavior to the extreme. She would bark and bray and climb on furniture, and other times she would pretend like she was flying. When someone would mention a holy name, Abigail would fall into convulsive fits. These behaviors are not reminiscent of ergot poisoning either. Soon, other girls fell under the same strange spell. They quickly blamed Tichiba and two other women, Sarah Osborne and Sarah Good, of witchcraft. 
Whatever else could be said of the Salem witch trials, that is how it started. While in court, the girls would suffer convulsions and fits and writhe on the floor any time one of the accused would speak. However, any time a magistrate or a judge would speak, the girls would return to normal. That's mighty specific for ergot poisoning. Some of the girls even started to separate themselves from the group because they felt like some of the other girls were actually playing up the symptoms too much. As I said earlier, Mary Kilborn Matosian does offer some records that do sound like ergot poisoning or some kind of poisoning did take place in Salem in 1692. Take this deposition from John Putnam. Mary Estick and Sarah Cloys and I myself was taken with strange kinds of fits but it pleased Almighty God to deliver me from them. But quickly after this, our poor young child was taken about midnight with strange and violent fits. It continued in strange and violent fits for about two day and two nights, and then departed this life by a cruel and violent death being enough to pierce a stony heart. Now this could possibly be ergot poisoning. The fact that it affected several people in the same household also points to ergotism as a possibility. The problem is, this account doesn't appear until April 1692, four whole months after the Salem witch trials began. We need reports of ergot-induced death and sickness from that time, from January of 1692. But none exist. So even if these later reports that do kind of sound like ergot poisoning in some cases, were in fact ergot poisoning, you could take them out of the equation and you would still have the Salem witch trials. Additionally, none of the girls exhibited any of the outward signs of ergotism, which are gangrene in some cases, and I don't think it was gangrenous, well I don't think it was any kind of ergotism, but it doesn't seem to have been gangrenous. Uh, but there's also loss of eyesight, none of the girls reported that. Loss of consciousness, none of the girls reported that. In fact, they went the opposite. They were, you know, losing their minds. And finally, peeling of the skin, which again, there's no reports of that either. So, did ergotism kick off the Salem witch trials? Absolutely not. But might ergot have reared its fungly little head a few months after it all started, that spring and summer of 1692? Well, yeah, that's totally possible. However, it would have nothing to do with what happened in Salem that year. Well, my friends, that's all I have for you this time, and like always, I'd love to thank you for stopping by. If you're into this kind of content and dig real psychedelic history, please give this video a like and a share, of course, if it be your will. Also, now that you know my thoughts, I'm curious about your thoughts. What do you think caused the sandwich trials? Do you know of any reports of ergot-like symptoms that uh, go back to January 1692 that I might have missed that might actually prove this theory correct? I'd love to see it, so please send it my way. And until next time, I'm Tom Hatzis, your psychedelic historian, reminding you that you free your mind by using your brain. Peace.